let's get started. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for uh, showing up to uh, tonight's meeting. Um, should be a little different tonight in uh, meeting in three parts. Um, and the first part is uh, an update on the bird atlas with uh, Chris Elphick. Um, and Chris, you can go ahead and share your screen and we'll get started. How's that? Good. Let's see my pictures. <clears throat> yep. So if I glance off to the side, it's because I'm looking at a different screen. I've got uh, the slide showing a separate screen and I've got you all in front of me. Uh, so should I make a start? Are we good to go? We're good to go. Okay. So I'll try to be brief because I don't want to take up too much of your meeting. I know that um, Chris has stuff to talk about that's maybe uh, better than what I have, but I just want to give people a bit of an update on where we are at and talk a little bit about priorities. And then I'm happy to answer any questions about the Atlas. Um, I think most people probably know the history, so I won't spend any time on that, except to say that we began in 2018 and we had planned to end field work um, at the end of February this year, but um, we added a year because of um, because of uh, all the uncertainty over the over the past year and people's inability to get out early in the summer. That said, the last year has been, I think, our most successful yet. Um, on the winter atlas, we just wrapped up our third field season. Um, this is a, a map of. Uh, maps of what the data looked like um, at the end of last winter. And so we split the winter season into kind of the early season, November to December, and then the late season, January, February. And um, what's mapped here is just the amount of um, times people spent birding in each block, with our goal being to get to 10 hours in each of the two uh, halves of the winter. And you can see at the end of last winter, we had you know, a fair number of blocks that had reached the 10 hour uh, target, but the majority had not. As of, about, it looks like this, um, and it's a bit better than that because I haven't, this did not include all of the February data that's come in and it doesn't include anything that's come in by mail yet. We've, uh, we've been working on trying to get some of that, um, all of that entered, but at least for the late winter, we don't have it all done yet. So things are um, things are really proceeding well. We certainly have some holes up here in the in the, the northeast. I, I managed to get things improved a fair bit in back in November and uh, uh, December, but um, once my heavy teaching load kicked in in January, that all fell apart. So I, so we're we're missing a lot of uh, effort up here, but we filled in a lot in many places. Um, in terms of the breeding atlas. Um, we, um, again, this comes from uh, a year ago uh, the, or the end of the, the 2019 breeding season that looked like this. This is a map of the number of species seen in a block. Um, and by uh, the end of last breeding season, it looked like this. So again, big jump, much, much more even coverage, um, feeling pretty good about the breeding survey. Um, Again, though this is just the number of species. If we look at the number of confirmed species, it's quite a bit lower, which we would expect, but, um, but you can see that there are certain blocks where we have a lot of confirmations. And when I can you know, pick out the block that my house is in and the block that Phil Rush's house is in, and I'm guessing this might be Dave Preventure's, uh, the block that Dave Preventure's house is in. And um, so we, we would like to be able to you know, beef up the, uh, uh, the, uh, the confirmations this year. So that's one of our top priorities uh, for the coming field season. And I, I put up this map, um, uh, this, this, this graph to show um, or to illustrate one of the big points we're trying to make about how to increase effort. Um, what this shows is the number of um, species confirmed in each month. And obviously there's not many species getting confirmed in the winter. Um, but it jumps up a lot. And in our first two years, we had this peak in June. Last year, we really kind of stressed 
the value of continuing to go out in July and August. And then the fact that in many ways, that's the best time of the breeding season because it's the time when you can confirm species most easily because so many parents are flying around with food in their beaks and um, birds right out of the, the, the nest. And you can see this big jump so that even though we had a little bit less effort or less time in the field last year because of the pandemic, the fact that people kept going out in July really kind of improved things. And we got this big bump in the number of confirmations. So I, I, I would just reiterate that, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, get out early in May and June, you know, people have been out tracking migrants and then things kind of taper off in the late summer, but the late summer when most other birding is a little slow um, is, is the perfect time to be out um, atlasing. Um, again, we have these, this way of measuring how complete we think a block is. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but we're trying to get to 20 hours in each block and, and, uh, and, and ideally those hours will be distributed in a way that leads to a fair number of confirmations. So we have this other measure. Um, and again, the, bright, the brighter yellow means that we're close to that metric. We don't feel that we have to get uh, like 100% in every block, you know, that's not the goal, but we're trying to encourage people to spend time, more time in blocks that maybe are down around 30% than in blocks that are like 70 or 80%. Um, you know, we really wanna kind of even things out so we get an even amount of pressure Oh, sorry, a survey effort um, everywhere. Um, and so our priorities for the upcoming field season are to try to get to that 20 hours in as many blocks as possible. Uh, blocks that have 60 hours are not blocks that really need a lot of extra effort. We pretty much know what's going on there at this point. Um, which is not to say, you know, if you find something new in one of those blocks, you should certainly submit it, that's great. Um, but, um, but if you're trying to decide where to spend time and you want to maximize the benefits to the atlas going to blocks that don't have many hours is the, the best thing for us. Um, we'd also really want to kind of emphasize species that are hard to detect and you know, they're the ones that we have the biggest gaps. And so um, this is just my pitch, owls or great horns are nesting already. This is my local backyard um, great horn, which is now nesting about uh, you know two or three hundred yards up the road in the yard of a, a former grad student from our department and um, she sent me this picture two or three weeks ago um, uh, and so getting out listening for owls right now would be great especially great horns and then later on in the summer other species and then and secretive marsh birds is another one that we know that we don't have as much data as we could so rails um, in particular be good to uh, be listening for those if you're in a place where you think you might uh, might find them and they haven't been reported yet. And then the, the, the biggest one, the biggest priority is to you know, spend as much time looking for species that we can confirm. And I can say particularly later in the summer, um, which is kind of nice, you know, migrations, you know, spring migrations over. So it doesn't interfere with looking for spring migrants and the fall migration hasn't really picked up or it's just starting to pick up so it doesn't interfere with that. So spend the birding time during those months out last thing would be really, really great. So that's that's all I have. Like I said, if you, if you have questions, happy to answer them now or you can contact me via any of the many routes shown here, except Facebook, I don't do Facebook, but if you go to the Facebook site, you can, you know, Craig will pick up on that, Craig Repass will get back to you or he'll pass it on to me either way. So that's that's what I have. Anyone have any questions? Yeah, Frank. Yeah, um, Chris, I, you know, the, there's been a, just a, a boom of people that are e-birding. Uh, I see new names every day. Um, mm -hmm. um, whether it's the winter atlas or the, or the breeding atlas. Um, do, are you able to get that data unless they share it with you? So we, we, we can, um, we can't get it immediately. So uh, it, anyone can get data from eBird, but it's only, re it's, it's kind of like a, re a release every three months. So, you know, the, our plan at the end of the project is to download all of the data that's available and then augment what we have. 
um, but we can't get it in real time. So we can't use it for updating our lists or the maps that we have or anything like that, which is why it's really valuable if people share stuff with us. Yeah. And, and the sharing also just lets us kind of know which blocks have a lot of effort, which ones we don't, which we, we won't, you know, and it's kind of helpful for us to know that, you know, kind of in not immediately real time, but in more or less real time. No, it's, there, there are, I should say there's also, there are problems, I mean, people who are not actively collecting data for the Atlas, um, for the for the winter stuff, it's, it's not too much of a problem, but but hotspots are a real nuisance for the, from, from the Atlas, as I've kind of talked about a lot, when people use hotspot markers, it, it's, it's, it's right. really a real pain um, if they're near to a block boundary. Um, and so we probably won't use any data that are attached to hotspot markers um, that just come from the basic eBird download um, because because they can create some problems. But but for other things, that those data are really really useful. And and then the, the last thing I would say on the breeding season, um, the basic if you just go to eBird and, and download their data, you don't get any of the breeding codes. Um, I mean, we know people at Cornell. We can probably get kind of a backdoor entry into their database and get some of that stuff if we really need to. Um, but um, but it's a lot harder to get the breeding code information than it is just the regular sightings. Right. Kimberly. Hi there, sorry my video is not on, um, but thank you for this. And um, I had a question, although I feel like now that I've just heard that the um, <clears throat> hotspot feature makes my information useless, this may be- oh, I didn't say that, I didn't say that. Oh. <laughs> No, no, no. It just oh. it, it just complicates things for us because the, the the trouble with hotspots. Let me explain a little bit more clearly. Um, the uh, uh, hotspots apply often apply to a fairly big area, and if that area overlaps uh, overlaps with a block boundary, mm. then we don't know which block the data are from. So mm. Hamanasset, for example, um, there are different parts of Hamanasset in three different blocks. Mm -hmm. And so if you use the basic ham and asset um, hotspot, every record will be in whatever block that mm -hmm. hotspot marker is in. Uh -huh. but the trouble with eBird is that, that all of the data are on a single checklist are tied to the place, right. the specific place where the marker is. And so if that marker is not in the same block that you saw the birds in, it puts the birds in the wrong block. I see. Thanks, thanks for that clarification. Yeah, yeah. So we just have to be careful with those data. Got it. As long as East Rock Park is in the same block, I, I'm probably okay. E East Rock is another one that spans two blocks. No. <laughs> and the marker is in the the marker. I think is in the block that just has a tiny bit of the park in it. So, oh. That, yeah, that's a place we've had problems with from the very beginning. All right. Well, I will I will try to adjust that. But my, <laughs> gosh, I learned more than I expected. But the question I actually raised my hand for was, um, I was wondering. Is, is it useful at all or does it just waste your time or, or, or is it not useful? If when I submit observations I sh on eBird, I share them with the bird atlas, if they're, if they're not news, you know, like if today I see morning doves singing again for the eighth day in a row in my yard, is it beneficial to share that or is it redundant information? So it, it, it really depends. And, it, and, and I would say if, if in doubt, share, um, mm -hmm. but um, because you know, we'd rather have more data and then you know, not, not use it all. Um, mm -hmm. But um, uh, you know, if, you're, if, if you're seeing the same birds every single day in exactly the same place, then you don't need to share it every single day, I would say. But, okay. but, but, there, are, but there is often value to sharing stuff, even if it's not, um, even if it's a species that has already been um, reported for a block, because we have other kinds of analyses. We're not just generating um, species lists. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of the most visible part of the data, mm -hmm. but, but we're also doing a whole lot of other analyses. And, and one, one thing that we will do at the very end is we'll create kind of timelines, which um, well, I guess my slides have gone, I have a slide of this, but, um, but, but we're gonna have a, but every species will, will generate um, a graphic mm. that shows the timeline for every single one of the breeding codes mm -hmm. so, that, so that we know the periods in which nests are available for every species. And we know the, ne the, the period in which uh, you see courtship display for every species. 
Hmm. And so for that, you know, um, any additional records would be useful, um, especially for any confirmed or probable breeding code. Okay, thanks so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? I have a I have a question. It's Lori. Um, Chris, are you Hi, still are you still going to enter data if it's submitted winter early and late winter? If it's submitted, because I do know some birders who go birding in, in my block, and I did see some species that I have never reported. Um, but it's really hard for me to get them to share their checklist. So I still want to work on that and give them a list of which specific checklist they should share. So will you still be entering winter data for a little uh, bit? Uh, while, if oh, I yeah. Work on that? yeah, I mean, we have another another field season. So I mean, what, I mean, you can send any, you can share any checklist that has not already been shared and we will pull it into the database right up until the point when we publish data online, which will be you know two years from now, which is not to say wait two years. <laughs> no, I, I was really just thinking about a few weeks or how long it takes me to get to them and say, you know, I really want to go through their the data and see what what will support. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that, that would be fabulous. Yeah, we have people who are share, sharing stuff from 2018 still and we just pull it into the database. It's really easy. Anything else? Okay, great. Well, like I said, right, people Chris, do have thank questions. You very much. Feel free to email me. Great. And uh, now let's take a look at uh, Chris Howe's experience doing the bird atlas. Chris, so, yep. Chris Elkwick, thank thank you so much, and. Um, Dennis, thank you for, I think, thanking you for asking me to do this. I usually say no, I'm doing too many things, but I'm really committed to the Atlas project and it's been a lot of fun. So um, uh, I, I know a lot of the people in this meeting have been helping. So I'm going to change my tone a little bit. Um, I was going to like twist people's arms to go do Atlas work, but I know a lot of you are already doing it. So. Um, I will um, show photos to help share the fun I have had doing uh, the work. I've been um, helping with the Atlas ever since it started, and I've done both breeding and breeding season surveys and winter surveys and some of the other ones as well. And I think I well, I know I've been to at least 43 different blocks, probably a few more than that. So uh, hopefully these photos um, will inspire you. Some are better than others. I took all of them while I was out atlasing. So um, I don't spend a lot of time trying to get the perfect shot, uh, but let's start, Dennis, please, with winter surveys. So winter surveys, there's still a lot of blocks um, at the edges of the state, especially where there have been zero winter surveys. I love them. Every bird you find is a good bird. But on days when I don't have time to spend all day driving uh, to the northeast corner, um, I will look to see what more local blocks might need a little more time. Um, asphalt, pavement is great. Shopping centers, great. So this Glaucus skull, Orange Plaza on top of Burlington Coat Factory. Next, please. Rusty Blackbird, Flanders Plaza, Route 161, parking lot. Next, please. Hamden Plaza. This peregrine falcon um, actually was the first nice surprise I got when I started doing shopping centers. This one was on top of Men's Warehouse. so. Um, I, again, winter surveys, it's cold, dress warmly, everything will help, um, but uh, there are only 237 days to go until uh, early winter starts up again on November 1st, not that I'm counting, so start making your plans now. 
um, breeding surveys, unlike the winter one hour time surveys are not timed and it's more of a stop, look and listen approach. Um, so you're not, your species count per hour is not gonna be what you might be used to, but you'll definitely see things that you probably would not have otherwise noticed. Um, go to the Atlas website, read the descriptions of the breeding codes and the list of safe dates um, and follow the safe dates for possible or probable breeding codes. But for confirmed breeding evidence like this red-tailed hawk carrying nesting material, um, safe dates don't apply. So uh, no matter when you see um, something like this, it is a confirmed uh, breeding code. There are special considerations like this wren carrying nesting materials. Wrens make nests that may not be used for breeding. And to quote Chris Elphick, wrens are weird. So read the uh, descriptions for the breeding codes. This would not um, be a confirmed breeding code. Again, wrens are weird. Next, Dennis, please. Um, we start getting a lot more uh, interesting when we can find nests. Um, what I usually do is if I see a bird going back and forth to the same site, uh, I'll watch for a while at a safe distance. I was lucky enough to see this red-eyed vireo in a nest in Hamden. And next, Dennis. This warbling vireo in North Franklin. Up at the same time in North Franklin, I saw my first ever um, um, nest, but I couldn't get a picture of it. Uh, so carrying food is next. July and August are really great times to confirm breeding. So oven bird, Carolina wren, next, house wren, Next, chipping sparrow, I love the green worms. Next, red-winged blackbird. And the winner, next, look at that robin. And uh, feeding the young is also really rewarding to see, usually. Next, this poor prairie warbler up in Waterford was feeding a brown-headed cowbird. Um, the good news is this confirms breeding for both species. Next, again, a song sparrow feeding a brown-headed cowbird. Next, this was really fun. I watched the, this family for a while in East Haven. Next, and uh, Chaotic feeding time. This was in Madison near a barn that had uh, an active nest for these barn swallows. So then the recently fledged ones um, have to be a little careful about using this particular breeding code and it really should only be used for birds that are recently fledged. So they don't fly that well. They're still in a family. Uh, if, if the adults are around, the young are following them bothering them, um, the young are begging. Those are really good signs in addition to um, the juvenile plumage like in this chipping sparrow and in this robin. And these, next, next please. These were just the cutest. There were four of these little white breasted nut hatch fledglings and the parents could not keep up with feeding them. Um, there are other times you'll see birds. Uh, they can be reported as incidental atlas observations. They don't have to be incidental type eBird reports. They can be anything, traveling eBird reports. But the atlas, because it's not a survey, wants them identified as incidental. So the next uh, photo, um, I was lucky enough to have this Baltimore Oriole in my backyard in Hamden this past winter. That's why it's such a nice close-up. It was on the clothesline. And next, 
I was out hiking in Woodbridge. Um, it was sort of late afternoon. I think I might have started an eBird track, but uh, was fortunate to see this barred owl. And um, I just love being out. Uh, most of my birding trips are doing work for the Atlas these days. So next, Dennis, please. Some of the other maybe more common birds that I've seen while out uh, is great blue heron in East Haven. Next, black cap chip chickadee this past summer at Quinnipiac Meadows. Next. Winter surveys white throated sparrow in Washington Depot. Next. This one I love to see East Lime winter survey. Dennis, I think this was your favorite photo, right? Eastern Toey. Um, next. This crazy yellow crown night heron. And next, I actually was out doing a winter survey in my block in East Haven when the snowy owl was reported. So I just walked over to see it and then it flew into my block. Um, next. Uh, this was uh, obviously summertime. Just don't tell Chris Elphick, but sometimes I just um, sit and watch a bird for a couple of minutes because they are so beautiful to see. Um, so there are always, while you're out birding, there are always other sites to see and adventures to have uh, traveling in Connecticut. I had a wonderful time driving to places I never would have visited except for the Atlas. So, uh, and on uh, Chris's colored map, I can tell which blocks I turned yellow. So plan to travel, um, look at the blocks, especially near the edges of the states. Um, maybe make a day of it and uh, help to bring them up to 100% to completion or work on some of the ones that have little time. Plus, you never know what you'll find. Next and next. Um, I couldn't find this nesting species to report it in eBird. This was up in Montville, but there were field sparrows nearby that I was able to report for the winter survey. So uh, th again, thank you, Dennis, for invi inviting me, and uh, I hope everyone enjoyed the talk. Thanks, Chris. It's quite obvious somebody has way too much free time. All right, so let's have a bird quiz. We've got uh, several bird quizzes. And the first one is this one. Size these birds from smallest to largest. We'll get the answers in a little bit. So if you wanna write them down or just remember them or whatever. I was looking for royalty free images that I could use and I came across a uh, ancient field guide. And I grabbed the images from that. Is that good? Because here's the field guide. And it's uh, available at this uh, website to, uh, to download. It's, it's really quite interesting. And some of the descriptions are 
to our ears hilarious, like this one. Read that. I will post the link to this uh, field guide on uh, the website. Uh, but I, I love the uh, description of uh, he, it's always he. Um, it's, uh, I got a real chuckle out of it. Carl, you wanna unmute yourself? There we go. Good evening, everybody. Uh, the title, Wildlife in My Backyard in Orange, I have to uh, fill in on some details about my backyard. Uh, from actually, the, back, my, the boundary of my backyard is also the boundary between the Regional Water Authority property in Orange and Woodbridge. So uh, there's um, actually a 600 acres of, of a property which uh, raises a whole lot of wildlife. And uh, quite frequently, uh, this is the type of thing that I see as I sit on my back porch. So uh, this, this is only one. Next slide. Uh, I do have a feeder outside uh, from uh, which is close to the boundary of the property, and uh, quite frequently, uh, this red-headed uh, red character uh, uh, comes up and drives all the other birds off and then flies in and sits there for a while and then disappears, and 15 minutes later, it's back. <laughs> Next slide. This is in a tree um, one, one of the shrubs out my front window. Uh, and this was taken, uh, this was taken last year. And uh, it's a robin's nest that is in one of the shrubs. And uh, it's, uh, it's used every year, so. Next slide. Um, there in the background, you can see of, um, is a, is the fence line. And beyond that is uh, the beginnings of the 600 acres of property that I'm talking about. But uh, every year we have this uh, this uh, group of turkeys uh, wandering through wandering through our yard, and they cross the street and go into my neighbor's yard across the street and wander all over his yard and feed. And then the parade crosses the street and comes back and goes into the water company property. And actually, uh, they've been seen roosting way up in some of the trees in the, in, 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 in the back part of uh, uh, the water company property. Looks like, uh, looks like a whole, uh, whole bunch of black balloons up in the tops, uh, hanging out in the tops of the trees. Uh, this is another thistle seed feeder, which um, with the house finches and, and so forth. Next. Um, I haven't seen this bird around uh, uh, for, for very much lately, but um, it used to be a frequent visitor uh, to, uh, to, to the bird feeder. Uh, this was actually taken um, in some of the, some, one of the large trees that we have uh, back from, uh, from, you know, from back in Washington. And um, he keeps coming, uh, coming, comes, keeps coming back to that spot, and sits there, 
and uh, it's an ongoing thing, month after month after month. So he's uh, definitely very territorial. Next. Uh, this is, uh, um, I try and have this type of plant hanging from uh, some, uh, some of the uh, uh, plant hooks uh, to attract uh, both the, uh, uh, the butterflies and the hummingbirds. Um, the hummingbirds are uh, kind, of, kind, of, kind of my, my, my favorite, but uh, we managed to catch this. Um, and uh, this is another hawk that, uh, uh, in addition to the one shown er er earlier, which uh, now seems to be competing with the other for, uh, for, for, for space in the woods here behind my house. So next. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, that was one of many. Uh, this is very typical of, uh, of uh, well, what I find in my backyard. Uh, I used to have a lot of forsythia growing all along the back fence. And uh, from, uh, they, they would come in, come in around the end of the fence of kind of where the deer is on the left-hand side there. And uh, uh, that's kind of where they can uh, come up uh, around the fence and get onto my property. And it's like uh, of, uh, a mowing machine Going down, going down the whole length of the uh, uh, the forsythia and, uh, and chomping on all the uh, all the vegetation there, day after day after day. So this is what my uh, this is a typical scene in my backyard. Next, thank you very much. Thanks, Carl. So let's see how how did you do here. Smallest goldfinch. Mm -hmm. Number three, the Baltimore Oriole. Difference between these is uh, an inch or an inch and a half from one to the next. And then uh, big old mallard. So uh, if you want, you can uh, put in the chat what your score was on this. That'd be interesting. And then uh, We'll take a look at the next quiz. So, true or false? Is this a Starling, Cardinal, or Robin? There are a few clues there. A murder, a parliament, or a conspiracy of crows? This is a frequent winter occurrence in my yard. Can, did you hear both of the crows? American crow and fish crow in there? Mixed flock. Yep. One of these is the name of the cedar wax wing from a while ago, a long while ago, which is it?
Does the fish crow eat anything besides fish? And here's a good one. Some of our favorite birds. House sparrow, European starling, and rock pigeon. Which is the most common of those non-native birds? In other words, which has the largest population in uh, North America? All right, next up we have uh, Nathan Reese, who is a high school student from Southington. He is, uh, or I should say he was the winner of Minunkatuck's uh, Hog Island Teen Camp uh, scholarship for uh, last year. And uh, when Hog Island uh, canceled all their programs with the pandemic, uh, we carried the uh, scholarship over and uh, barring the unforeseen, Nathan will be going to um, Hog Island this summer. Uh, Nathan, are you unmuted? Yep. Okay. Yes, I am. All right, here we go. All right. So good evening, everyone. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, as you can see by the title of the slide, I'm just gonna be sharing a few of my favorite photos I've taken over the years. I've been doing nature photography, primarily birds for, I think, I don't even know now. I think since I was seven years old, obviously I've done like varying degrees of it. Um, started off with a point and shoot camera. And from there on, now I think I, now I have a Nikon D500 with a 200 to 500 millimeter lens. So I've just upgraded. Um, so I guess let's start off. All right, so I'm gonna be starting off with a few of my more exotic photos, not exactly birds, and then I'll work into some more native birds. Um, so this was a crocodile photo that I took on, I think the Tarcoles River in Costa Rica. I really like this photo because it's just so intense. Um, it's staring right at the camera. I thought that was super cool. This is one of the first photos that I've actually like experienced or experimented a little bit of with editing. Um, as you can see, I could brighten it a little bit. It was a really dark day out, so I had to get a little creative there. And I don't know, I just thought it was super cool how intense it was. Next. Um, this right here, this is a, um, I actually, I have it in my notes somewhere. I'm not that good with butterflies, but I've always thought they were just super, super, um, spangled just beautiful. Fritillary. I think it's, uh, yeah, spangled um, fritillary. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not that good with identification of um, a lot of other animals besides birds, but um, I've always like wanted to get into macro photography, but I've ha I haven't exactly had the best um, like camera setup or anything like that. So I was super proud of this photo when I got it. I like, um, I've always liked taking photos of butterflies with a side profile as opposed to the top profile. I don't know why. I just thought it's really cool to be able to see their proboscis in the flower. Next. This is a um, rose-breasted grosbeak that I took, um, I think it was this year in my backyard. I think it's on an oak tree. And when I take photos of birds, I like to get a lot of personality. And I just thought this was super cool because it almost looks like it's waving at the camera. I know I waited for this photo for a long time, waiting for it to do something, um, I don't know, photo worthy. And I just thought it was super cool. I remember I was testing out my new camera for the first time and I was super excited. And I just love all the like amazing colors on its breast there. Um, next. So this was actually a really, really big surprise. This was when I was in um, Cadia National Park um, in Maine. This was also this year. And um, I think this is a baby spruce grouse. I'm not certain on that at all. I'm sure some of you guys could correct me on that. Um, but these actually, I think there were three of them and then a mother. 
and they let me and my mom get super, super up close to them. And what was amazing about it was just all the greenery in the background and it allowed me to really get up close and test out my camera. Um, and it was just super amazing because I got to experiment with like all sorts of lighting that I normally wouldn't be able to if, um, if the birds were more skittish. And I think I was there for around like an hour just taking pictures of these one or two birds in the set. And it was just amazing because they were just standing there and perching and I could get in with within like five feet of them and they wouldn't even run away. And it was super cool. Next. So um, this is a, I think, common turn that I got at Ham and Asset. When I first started off taking photos, I think I took this photo when I was, I want to say nine years old. Um, when I first started off taking photos, one of the things I would do the most is go to Ham and Asset Beach State Park and just go out there and take photos of birds in flight. I mean, it helped me like improve my reaction time with the camera. And I just, it just helped me um, like focus on the birds and learn how to um, like get around um, focusing the birds in the foreground as opposed to getting them blurry with the background. And that's when I took this photo and I actually didn't know I had it until like, I think, three months later when I checked my camera roll and found it. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And I guess that's it for this one on um, next. And this is one of my favorites. This is a goal again at Hammonasset um, Beach State Park. I think this was the same day actually. Um, it was a really good day for photography. Um, and I take a lot of pictures of goals there. I love to see them fly up and drop all the shells on the concrete. That's probably my favorite bird behavior ever, just watching the gulls drop their shells and crack them open. I just thought that was so cool, how, like all their engineering that they do. Um, and I'm sure those shells are a little too small for them to be doing with in the photo, but I always thought that was a cool little beach scene. Um, next. This is um, a song sparrow on my weeping cherry tree in my backyard. Also, when I was young, I think this was, I took this when I was around nine. Um, one of my favorite things to do was take photos on my weeping cherry tree in my backyard because in the spring it would have nice white flowers. And then in the fall, it would get, get nice orange and red and greens. So it's just great. And I would get all sorts of birds from morning doves, blue jays, song sparrows, grosbeaks, just everything coming there. And it was great practice for me. And I could just incorporate all sorts of different types of photography and all different types of birds into my work. Next. And this is the Junko, same tree. I think um, a little later into the fall, you'd see pine trees in the, back, in the background. Um, the Junko was actually the first bird I ever took a photo of. I don't know why, um, but Junko's got me hooked on birding and photography as a whole. Um, I, when I first got my camera, I just took a photo of a Junko and I was hooked. I don't know. I'd never really taken the time to look at the individual species of birds. So it was really interesting when I first realized, like, be, even back then I was like seven years old. So I'm like, hey, there's more than one species of sparrows or stuff like this. So it was really interesting. That's why I love Junkos so much. So I just wanted to include that. Next. This is a barred owl. I think I took this photo um, two years ago in central Connecticut, this was super cool. Cause I was probably only like 20 feet away from this. Um, I was, I think I was collecting bugs with an entomology group, um, from my old middle school. And, um, we came across this barn owl at, or this barred owl at dusk. And it was just super cool. We got super up close to it. And it was the first time I actually got to see an owl that up close. Cause since then, I think I saw a few burrowing owls um, out west and a few great horned owls, but this is the first time I got to see one up close and it just stayed there and it was beautiful. And I don't know, that's about it. Next. Now this is a, um, I think this is a barn swallow that I got on some barbed wire. It's one of my favorite photos because just how vibrant the colors are in the barn swallow. And also I like how it um, 
it's brighter around the barn swallow and then it fades into darker green in the background. Um, I also like just the simplicity of it. Barn swallows have also been one of my favorite foot or favorite birds to just practice photography on because of how fast they move and they just give me good kind of target practice and like training and they're pretty common just like tree swallows so I could just I don't know practice with them so that's why I wanted to include this next and this this is my crown jewel um I guess this is the bird that um this is the bird that I have probably won the most with or the photo I've won the most with I think I took this in 2015 and this is a goldfinch on a I don't know what type of flower this is but I just love this photo so much it's got all those beautiful colors in there um very pretty green goldfinch and um I don't know this is just definitely my favorite photo I've ever taken next and this is also one of my favorite photos um it's I think it was in um I want to say Utah that I got it. It's on a bird feeder, which usually I like to take my photos out in the wild, um, not on bird feeders. I don't know why. It's just my style. But obviously with hummingbirds, it's very hard to get in-flight photos like out in the wild. And this is one of my favorites because at the time I didn't have the best camera. And it was one of the first times I actually was able to capture like birds in flight like this. And I like that there's three subjects, which is super cool. And also it's one of the other times that I've used editing to make my photo um, look different, which was the learning point for me. Next. And that's my website. Anyone have any questions for Nathan? Uh, thanks, Nathan. And um, we're going to expect a similar report next year with, with your experiences up at Hog Island. All right, here are the answers. Thank you. To, you bet. Great. Here are the answers to the potpourri. Of course not. Females look kind of like uh, overgrown sparrows or something. How uh, did you get this one? It's a northern cardinal. You can see the little bit of the crest kind of making its way there. There's a starling and uh, the robin. Yeah, the bill too. It is, of course, a murder of crows. Well, how about this one? Cherry bird. It's hardly at all fish. They might eat fish if they uh, find something along the shore, but uh, they'll eat anything. Same as uh, American crows. And the most most numerous in North America. It's the European starling by a factor of five over the the uh, rock pigeon. All right, here's part three, enagrams. This is a little trickier. So 
So these anagrams are, are of the birds you see on the right. So what's what? And no, I didn't make these anagrams up. Uh, there's a, of course, if you Google anagram, anagram generator, you'll find some uh, website that will uh, take a word and make, uh, in this case, like dozens of anagrams out of it. Give you a few more seconds to work on these. Okay. Here's another one. Blurred photos. Who am I? What is that? about this guy? What have we here? And this one. And the last one. And then finally, my turn at the St. Augustine Alligator Farm in Florida. Uh, it's a really cool place. Uh, There's a walkway around it, uh, way above the alligators. And um, the alligators provide a lot of uh, protection for the uh, herons that. Uh, roost in these trees. Um, they're sort of uh, predator proof with the alligators there. Not too many uh, raccoons are gonna make their way up the trees and steal uh, eggs or chicks. Of course, if a chick gets a little excited and uh, jumps out of the nest, well, it's uh, alligator food, but you can get really up close and personal with the birds. Most of these, most of these photos are taken at a distance of, uh, I don't know, six to 15 feet or so. And 
And the birds do not care one whit about all the people because uh, there are always people there. This is kind of unusual with this snowy grit with the uh, red lords there. It's uh, that's the height of the of its breeding time. It goes away. You can see there's three families right here. Super, super great place to, to take photos of uh, breeding herons. The, uh, the time to be there is between February and, um, and April. February, they're, they're starting to get busy. And then in April, uh, the chicks are uh, close to being ready to leave. Whoops, let me go back. This guy was turning the eggs over. He was just hunkered down there, maybe uh, maybe eight feet away. So St. Augustine Alligator Farm, great place to go. All right, so here we are. Here are the anagram answers. KG Artbird is a great cat bird. Did you get that one? Undoing mo Mover. Morgan's Prow Song Sparrow. Wallet's War Tree Swallow. And Terrapin Lump. I love that one. Purple Martin. How'd you do there? And the Who Am I's. All right, here's the first one. Come on, come on. I love you, but you are so goddamn insistent on my fucking attention. Uh, Robert, you might want to mute yourself. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I was talking to my cat, sorry. <laughs> Did you get that? Nathan's favorite bird. This one's probably pretty easy. Scarlet Tanager. Not too many birds that are that yellow. American goldfinch. This one's probably pretty easy with the posture too. Oh, look at that, it's got a crest. Northern Cardinal. And maybe, uh, I don't know, is this the toughest? Yes, indeed, it's a titmouse. Oh, 
So that brings us to a close. Um, the end of the month, we've got uh, Jerry Connolly coming coming on board with uh, Namibia and Botswana. He was reluctant to do this because he's done the program before, but he did it before 10 or 11 years ago. And I think we can uh, all enjoy another visit to, uh, to Africa with Jerry. Um, and uh, I'll thank you all for, uh, for coming tonight. Thank Chris Elphick for giving us an update on uh, the bird atlas. And uh, Chris, Carl, and Nathan for uh, sharing their photos. And um, 